Good evening, everyone, and welcome to USM's fifth annual W.E.B. Du Bois lecture. We are just going to wait one moment while everyone populates in from the webinar. We will get started in just a minute. And as we get started, I see that someone um, who just logged in has your hand raised. If you just put a note in the chat instead, we can answer you that way. It's nice to see everybody, welcome. Okay, good evening. My name is Libby Bischoff, and I'm the executive director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education here at the University of Southern Maine, as well as a professor of history. It's my true pleasure to warmly welcome you all this lovely spring evening to USM's fifth annual W.E.B. Du Bois Lecture in Race and Democracy co-sponsored by the Osher Map Library, the Department of History, the Race and Ethnic Studies Program, and the Department of Geography and Anthropology at the University of Southern Maine. We are honored to be hosting this event this evening, and we wanna thank everyone for tuning in from wherever in the world you are joining us. Just a few technological reminders. This is a Zoom webinar, so all attendee videos and mics automatically remain muted for the duration of the program. You'll only be able to see the images of the moderators, uh, the presenters, and our ASL interpreters this evening. Your ASL interpreters on screen are April Jackson and Felicia Williams, and we are very happy to have them with us this evening. The event is also being live captioned and recorded. If you would like to watch with the closed caption, the live captioning, you simply need to just hit the CC closed caption button at the bottom of your own Zoom screen. Our featured speaker this evening is Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste, who will momentarily present a lecture entitled W.E.B. Du Bois in Our Time from Black Reconstruction to Black Lives Matter. After her presentation, We'll go into a moderated Q&A period where you will be invited to type your questions into the Q&A and we'll get to as many questions and comments as we can before the program ends at 730. Before I introduce my co-hosts and my co-moderators this evening, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement as it is our custom for Machigun, the truest name in Maliseet poet Miku Paul's words, of the now called city of Portland, Maine, where the Osher Map Library and Smith Center sits on the campus of the University of Southern Maine. We sit on land that was once water and once part of a water-based ecosystem, which for thousands of years before the French and English ever set foot on the neck, provided for the indigenous peoples of the Don land, the Wabanaki, and those who were here from the beginning in kinship with the land and the water. We acknowledge this truth as we acknowledge the contemporary presence of the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples, the Wabanaki Confederacy. As, and as we acknowledge the devastation of settler colonialism past and present. And we take a moment to acknowledge and we invite you to do the same if you wish that a land acknowledgement, no matter how sincere, is only a beginning to our collective work. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Leroy Rowe, Chair of the Department of History and Associate Professor of African American History and Politics here at USM, who will share brief remarks about the history of the Du Bois Lecture at USM as we celebrate its five-year anniversary this evening. Welcome, Leroy. You're muted, my friend. 
Thank you, Dr. Bishop, and we appreciate your support for the Du Bois lecture. Um, I was asked this evening just to give a brief synopsis of what this lecture is about and, and its genesis, how it came about. And it, it really began with me making an attempt to teach Du Bois seminal work, The Souls of Black Folk at USM. And it led to various different questions. And one student in particular asked, you know, why the need to teach civil rights? Why the need to teach black history? Why not just teach American history? And it was a valid question, but I also understood in that question, so much was missing from the student's own education on understanding about the American democratic experience. And naturally W.E.B. Du Bois is considered the father of the black freedom struggle, the black protest movement. But W.E.B. Du Bois in many ways was also the keeper of America's moral conscience on the question of race and racial inequality. It's just natural that this lecture is named in his honor. It's also a question of considering what it means to be human being in this country. Not just what it means to be American, but what it means to be human being, human dignity. And I believe so much of Du Bois work was centered on the spiritual healing of African-American peoples and also of Americans more generally. And that's the genius for this lecture. And we would hope to see this lecture continue and to bring renowned individuals and scholars to this campus to be able to speak on these issues to our students, our faculty, our staff, our broader community here in Maine. And again, we thank you, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste, for gracing us with your presence. At this point, I'm going to um, turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lance Gibbs. Thank you. Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste is Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst which was established to engage audiences in discussion and scholarship about global issues involving race, labor, and social justice. Dr. Battle Baptiste is a historical archeologist who focuses on the historical intersection of race, class, and gender in shaping cultural landscapes in the African diaspora. Her theoretical interests include Black feminist theory, African-American material and expressive culture, and critical heritage studies. Her work spans a variety of historic sites in the Northern and Southern United States, including the home of Andrew Jackson in Nashville, Tennessee, a Rich Neck Plantation in Williamsburg, Virginia, the Abel Smith School in Boston, and the W.E.B. Du Bois home site in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Her latest um, research is a community-based archeology span project at the Miller's Plantation site on the island of Eleuthera in the Bahamas. Dr. Battle Batiste is both a scholar and an activist who has directed community archeology span projects and sees the classroom as a place to engage contemporary issues with a sensibility of the past. Her publications include her book, Black, Feminist Archaeology. She's currently finishing up a second edition of Black Feminist Archaeology, which will be out in 2021. And the W.E.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America in 2019, which she co-edited with Britt Russert. I must highlight here that we at USM use Voices Data Project Portraits as a common read prior to this lecture. Dr. Batiste, welcome. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. That, yeah. So I am extremely honored to be um, asked to give this uh, lecture today um, for a multiple of reasons. And part of that is the fact that, well, first, I, I want to um, also acknowledge I'm coming from South Hadley, Massachusetts, which was once um, the Nipmuc and the lands of the Pocumtuck nations. And I am originally from New York City, but my family is from North Carolina. And we are also uh, a part of the um, Eastern Band Cherokee Nation, those who did not take the trail of tears and stayed behind and became hidden in plain sight. Um, and having that history in my own family um, is part of the reason why I wanted to look to history, which eventually led me to archeology span to find out more about my past, the, the past of my family, because our past was rather painful, whether it was the Jim Crow South or whether it was the erasure of our indigeneity. It was um, a history that was present, but invisible at the same time. So what I wanna to talk to you about today, and I will be sharing my slideshow momentarily, I really just wanted to um, engage with you all um, and say that the story that I plan to tell today has many facets to it. It's not just about Du Bois as scholar. It's not just about Du Bois as activist. It is also about Du Bois as a man of African descent or a black man living in a country where his rights, his identity, his equality were never guaranteed. And it was something that he wanted to bring to light, not just to people that looked like him, but he wanted to bring this attention to the world. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm beginning with a rather provocative title because I have from Black Reconstruction, which is 1866, um, well, it's the Reconstruction era is post-emancipation, right? Immediately after freedom is, is won through the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as the ending of the Civil War. But I'm bringing it to Black Lives Matter not to highlight one movement as in Black Lives Matter, but to just talk about the fact that the, the, the concept and the events and the history of Reconstruction is not taught in the ways that as a Du Bois scholar myself, I believe should be taught. I feel like there's much more to understanding our nation as an early Republic. So for me, 1776 is not quite, I'm sorry, yeah, 1776 was not for me the moment of freedom. It was from the shackles of England, but as Frederick Douglass said in his speech, the meaning of the 4th of July to the Negro, what, what does the celebration of the 4th of July 1776 have for African-Americans living in the United States in 1776. It did not mean freedom for my ancestors. And so for me, 1866 was the beginning of that new nation, that new nation that was, a, was not fully incorporated into what we understand to create an American story or American history. But what I'm talking to you about tonight is Du Bois's role in how we understand the past, how we should see, there we go. 
okay? It wasn't moving. <laughs> um, how we should begin to understand Du Bois. So I wanna to talk to you about Du Bois as a man, as a man who traveled the world in pursuit of understanding the ways in which blackness operated and blackness was um, understood, lived, experienced in different places. And I, I say this because at the beginning of Du Bois' uh, history, I skipped ahead, okay. We're gonna start here. So I show this picture of myself because I, I want to tell you a little bit about my relationship with Du Bois, but also my understanding, not just growing up in the home in which I did, where my mother made sure that I understood the complexities of our past as a nation and not just what is taught in schools, but also my decision to attend a historically black college, join a, um, a black Greek letter organization, but understand the importance and the significance of being in a space in which you did not have to question who you are based on your race now, of course, at historically Black colleges, we have many issues internally. However, I understood Du Bois as someone who also attended a historically Black college, taught at more than one historically Black college, but also talked about the power and the strength of education to Black people. So I'm just take, taking you from that little kernel of kind of, you know, where I'm coming from with Du Bois. And, and I want to say that I came to understand Du Bois um, as so as I was a fan of Du Bois. And what happens when you uncover the archives is often you find a lot of truths that you have to say, this person was definitely a human being. And made decisions and choices that I don't understand, but it made him and more human to me. It made me understand how between Jim Crow, between his getting an education at Harvard, still did not insulate him from the kinds of atrocities that were happening across our nation to African-Americans. So I take you really quickly to um, the Du Bois library that is um, here pictured. And it is a 26 story library, which is the tallest academic library in the world. You get to know this when you work at the library and they tell you these wonderful tidbits of history. Um, but a lot of our students often think that this uh, this building was named the Du Bois Library from the beginning, and it was not. It was a grassroots effort. It was um, students who wanted to see Du Bois represented because at the top of that library on the 25th floor are housed his papers, which were acquired from Shirley Graham Du Bois in 1973. And um, the library was finally named for Du Bois in 1994. So there was a long period between when we received the papers and when the Du Bois library um, became what it is today. And it is, we will also talk about some of the hesitation that people have behind kind of abandoning what Du Bois was after his NAACP and editor of the crisis days. Um, and I think that that people miss a lot of the amazing um, work and scholarship that he did if you try to kind of erase who he was because of his belief that communism was one way in which people of African descent could actually figure out or be somewhat adjacent to equality. 
economically, socially, and uh, racially. And so these kinds of, of these kinds of movements were not foreign in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Many African American um, scholars and activists were embracing of the communist way of life and communist theory. So this is an example of a look into, and most people don't get to see this, but I'm letting you um, into the back room, so to speak, um, to show you um, a wall of the boxes of, of papers. And there are over 100,000 documents that are within the Du Bois collection. Among them are what is on the right of the, the screen here is his doctorate from Harvard. And um, it's important because he was the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard. But Du Bois said from the beginning, he went to Harvard and was never of Harvard. And um, we'll get into that as well. So I'm taking you back to the library a, a couple of floors down and giving you a, an image of an empty Du Bois Center. We don't often have empty. Um, of course, I'm speaking pre-pandemic, but um, it's a space that has become a, a research home away from home uh, for our postdoc fellows, our graduate fellows. We also have community col college scholars that um, would come to events. We have specific things um, targeted around kind of not the, the well super known about Du Bois. What we want to, to convey to people is that when you uncover and when you look into the archive, there are so many stories that you might not have known about, but everyone finds something different in the same papers, looking at the same collection. And it is amazing to see how all of this um, comes together through what I look at as, as the archive as, an art, as artifacts, because I'm very much into material culture. Um, I like to show this because the truth is, is that my office is at the Du Bois Center, which is located on the 22nd floor. Um, and it is a beautiful um, vision, scenery out there. But it also reminds me often when I look out and I look out of the Du Bois Center, how much more work needs to be done in our nation, in our world. So I can look atop from, um, this is a brown tower, um, not an ivy tower, but this, is, this, this tower is something that we hope to bring people up to not looking down at people. So I think that that is also important for us to convey, but it's also convenient being a couple of floors down from the Du Bois collection. Um, it is something that uh, I, I don't, I, I'm sure working among maps as you all do, you can understand the tactile emotion that comes from touching the documents that are written by someone like Du Bois or letters that are correspondence with people you never knew Du Bois was in contact with. These are the kinds of gems that are in the archive. So just showing you people actually occupying the space of the Du Bois Center. Um, so I wanna start off a little bit with the early days of, of Willie as he was called. Um, this, this picture all the way to the left is a picture of an infant Du Bois, a, his mother holding him. Her name was Mary Sylvania Burkhardt. And ironically, I literally just found this completed photo two days ago. It's online. It's at the Schomburg Center. But we have been at the Du Bois Center and UMass using this middle photo for years and years. 
And we now realize that it was cropped. It was pretty damaged, as you can see on the original photo. But what we also realized is that this photo in the middle, we got that directly from Shirley Graham Du Bois's um, book that is to the right called Du Bois, a pictorial um, biography that she published, his second wife published after Du Bois um, had passed. And so perhaps she cropped it, we don't know, but um, the beauty is that I want you to understand that the family that Du Bois grew up with was a family that not only nurtured him, but also believed in him as part of the generation who was going to move beyond service. And when I say this, I say it because Du Bois was one of the first to not only go all through school, but to finish high school and then go on to college. But it, it wasn't, it was much more of a group collective Burkhardt effort to make sure that he had the books he needed, that he had the clothing that he needed to attend school on a daily basis. And for him to focus, although he had odd jobs as a child, um, something that I cannot convince my young children that they should take on you know, jobs at their young ages, but Du Bois's mom suffered from a pretty extensive um, stroke. So her ability to work regularly was, was, was impacted. And because of that, Du Bois really brought money into the house, but Mary Sylvania the entire time was focused on his finishing his schooling. Du Bois at a young age knew he would go to Harvard because he was from Massachusetts and graduating from Sears High School in Great Barrington, Du Bois, this is a very pixelated photo, please forgive. He is all the way to the left, the only African-American in, in his class. He um, was the top of his class. And from this point, it was clear that there was a lot of community effort that was put into Du Bois's success. This is something that follows Du Bois throughout his life, even while he was at Harvard. But I, I show this because it was, it, it, it was apparent to him that he was different because of the color of his skin, because of the status of his family members, but it didn't stop him from being committed to education, learning all that he could. His mother, he and his mother attended First Congregational Church in Great Barrington. And they, um, along with one or two other churches, raised funds to send Du Bois to Fisk University. And this is where I have argued in, in lectures before, I believe that W.E.B. Du Bois, I don't wanna say becomes black, <laughs> but I want to say is when he understands the power of a collective understanding of what race means to the individual. This is his graduating class, much smaller than it would be today. Um, but imagine going from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, the Berkshires, to Nashville, Tennessee, in a space that is still dictated by the laws of Jim Crow, a place where segregation is the norm, a place where he enters into an environment that at first kind of gives him a hard time. He reports that going to Fisk was eye-opening, um, but it also made him realize that he, and I quote him, was thoroughly of New England. Like, so what, what I mean by this is that 
there are certain cultural cues that you learn from growing up in spaces that are predominantly black, predominantly white, mixed. But in this case, the idea of walking past each other without greeting, without nodding your head, without acknowledging each other in the street was not something that black folks did at Fisk. Everyone acknowledged each other. Du Bois was thoroughly New England. He really kind of, you know, they made fun a little bit of his accent, um, it being also thoroughly New England, but also he had to learn how to walk and navigate among his own people. And this is something that took him beyond kind of the constraints of his family because his family was his first ideas and notion about race and the power of, of, of black collectivity. So <clears throat> I'm, I really fast forwarded pretty quickly. Um, I've got him already graduated from Howard, but before I do, I'll just keep it here for a minute um, because one of the things that I learned um, being close to the archives is um, <laughs> looking and seeing three degrees from Harvard and in the papers. And I, I wondered wh why does he have three degrees? He got his PhD from there, but he went to Fisk. So what I learned is that when he left Fisk, he went to Harvard and what would have been equivalent of a bachelor's was not accepted, was not acknowledged. So he had to get his bachelor's, his master's, as well as his PhD from Harvard. And in many ways, uh, very similarly to him growing up in Great Barrington, it was women's or Black women's organizations in the Boston Cambridge area that helped Du Bois get through those three degrees. And by that, I mean home cooked meals, being able to do his laundry. These are very basic things that he could not do in a segregated Harvard. Again, he went to Harvard, he was not of Harvard. So when I tell the story of Du Bois, I often, and it's not just because I'm at another large school in the state of Massachusetts, it's not competition. However, there's a certain, there's a certain way in which I understand Harvard through the eyes of Du Bois. And for him, it was a fulfillment of a promise that he made to his mother, who by the way, I failed to mention, passed away just after he graduated high school. And he writes in, I believe it's Dusk of Dawn, that he believes that if she had lived, he is not sure if he would have been able to jump up, graduate high school and go to Nashville. He probably would have stayed behind to take care of his mother. And he says in some ways, or implies in some ways that it was that relationship and that goal that his mother had for him that in some ways dictated, not dictated, that her death released him from Great Barrington so he could explore the world. And that's, it's a pretty sad sentiment, but in some ways he really saw the conviction of his mother as being one of the very things that helped him with that strength. That strength translated to those women helping Du Bois as a Harvard student struggling to do what he had to do to get through the program. But also he was fortunate enough to be the benefactor of <clears throat> the John Slater Fund for the education of freedmen is the, the lengthy title of the money that he received to study at University of Berlin. So while at Harvard and having finished his bachelor's, probably his master's, he goes to live in Germany where he speaks of, and I'm, I'm actually gonna go back to this picture. 
because the picture, the individual picture of Du Bois that is on the right of your screen is the Du Bois that goes to Germany, right? He is now more fully aware of his position within the race, but he's still learning. At the same time, he goes to Germany and remarks this, I have felt fully human two times in my life. The first was at the home of my grandparents, Sally and Othello Burkhardt. The second was my studies in Germany. For him, it was the first time as he was seen as a man and not as a black man. This is kind of the attachment that he has for Germany. Um, plus he loved German classical music. Okay. But also what he brought back with him was a certain debonair quality that was very cosmopolitan as well as um, distinctive. Um, I, I'm going to throw out a term, and if there's a question about it later on, I'm more than happy to explain it. But in all sense of the term, I would call W.E.B. Du Bois, when he's coming back from Germany to finish at Harvard, 1895, 1896, or 1895, I would say that he was definitely what we would describe as a dandy. He dressed impeccably from head to toe. He carried a cane. At times he had some white gloves with him, but it's also that mustache, that distinctive mustache. And it's all about his appearance. And for me, I'm looking at the, the material that defined who he was. And he was setting kind of an example. He was, he was um, kind of letting people know who he was when he walked into a room. And he had a very large energy, even though he wasn't that tall. Here, I have him at Wilberforce University uh, in Ohio, where he, after graduation, he really believed that he would um, receive a, an appointment at a major university. Um, it didn't quite happen. And he went to Wilberforce, um, where he met his wife. I'm gonna use my little arrow here. This is um, Nina Gomer, who was a student of his and they were married in 1896. Right after their marriage, they quickly moved to Philadelphia because Du Bois would embark on, sorry, skip to Atlanta. He would embark on field work for the Philadelphia Negro. So he would actually, between um, 1896 and 1897, he was interviewing um, men and women that were living in an all black enclave in Philadelphia. This work in 1896 and 1897, as uh, author and scholar and Du Bois scholar, Alden Morris in his book, The Scholar Denied, talks about how impactful the methods, the sociological methods that Du Bois used in his research, the quantitative methods, the ways in which he was looking at income, social status, class, the material within your home, um, marriage status, how many children. These are the kind of systematic um, bits of information that Du Bois was collecting. And he had learned a lot of these methods by way of his work in Germany. Because in the same way was this burgeoning field called sociology, Du Bois did not learn from those in the United States teaching this new sociology. He went to the source, which is Germany, and learned from them and also decided this is a way for me, the data, the data does not lie. The data is how we are going to set the record straight. Poverty is because of segregation, not the lack of drive or opportunities, 
if opportunities are limited, how can we move up in this society? So all of these kinds of questions are coming up and they're literally not reversing, but they are questioning the ways in which African-Americans have been depicted historically and, and in terms of the scholarship around the lives, the everyday lives of black people. So he doesn't get hired at the University of Pennsylvania. He goes to another historically black college, by the way, Wilberforce is also a historically black college. He goes to Atlanta University. This is 1897. When he is in Philadelphia, his wife, Nina, is pregnant. And um, for her, it's really rough, him out doing field work, her at home in this teeny apartment. Um, and it was getting harder and harder for her to handle this. And so when he got the appointment, they quickly rushed to Atlanta and had their first son, um, Burkhard Du Bois. So, and I know I'm telling you a history, but I'm hoping that I'm giving you some tidbits that you might not have heard or might not have thought about. So I'm hoping that this lecture allows you to kind of see the more fullness of Du Bois because it's that fullness, it's that sincerity, and it's that constant work that creates a, a space for Du Bois to always be relevant. So I go back, I go I fast forward a little bit to um, 1899. And this is April, around April of 1899, a man by the name of Sam Holes, or his alias was Sam Holes, was um, lynched um, right, after, right outside of Atlanta. Du Bois is directly impacted by this. Um, some people would argue, like, you know, I've heard their controversy between Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois. I wanna say Ida B. Wells is in a category all by herself because Du Bois is a scholar who is a teacher and an ethnographer in many ways. Ida B. Wells is a journalist. She is on the front line. She is a woman who is beginning almost single-handedly, but with the help of many club women, pushing and pushing and pushing for our government to acknowledge the fact that lynching is something that should not ever be tolerated. And I wanna say that the anti-lynching bill, I believe has just come into legislation and this is 2021 and we're talking 1899. So I just wanted to bring up Ida B. Wells because I want to make sure that she's placed in that genealogy of the anti-lynching because Du Bois wasn't necessarily a champion of it because remember what I told you, it was data. It was the real data of the everyday lives of black people that were going to, to create change. And it was that Sam Ho's incident like none other. And I'm gonna ad lib his experience that day. It was a, a, a pretty hot day in Atlanta. He's walking from Atlanta University. He is going to see um, an editor to turn in a piece about anti-lynching, like in the Du Bois voice. And he doesn't take the streetcar. Why? Because it's segregated and he doesn't want to give money to that. So as he does, he walks most places that he goes with his cane and his mustache and his gloves and of course his hat. So what happens at this point is that as he is walking down the street, he learns that the knuckles, the knuckles of Sam Hoes are on display in a jar in a butcher shop 
that he is about to pass. He says that it stopped him in his tracks. It stopped him in his tracks and he realized that data was not the only thing that was going to change the United States. A month later, here is Nina, Young, Burkhard, and Du Bois together. And this is one of the rare photos because Burkhardt passes away at 18 months. He had um, diphtheria and Du Bois could not secure a black doctor. He could not bring his son to a hospital. His son passed away. It impacted the relationship between Nina and W.E.B. to the extreme. And Du Bois, I actually realized I left out a, a major part. As Nina Gomer is becoming more and more pregnant and realizing that Philadelphia and his field work is not the place for her, he actually sends her where? to his family in Great Barrington. So Burkhardt is born in Massachusetts as well. And when Burkhardt dies a month after the Sam Hose incident in 1899, his body, his remains are sent to be buried at Mahewi Cemetery in Great Barrington. He did not want his son buried in the, the, the clay soil of Georgia as he as he put it, under the, under, the veil, under the veil of Jim Crow. Um, and he writes uh, a chapter in Souls of Black Folk that is called, it's probably one of the most moving things I've ever read of Du Bois, but it is the passing of the firstborn. And it is extremely emotional, but you only see a glimpse of how it impacted his wife, Nina. So I wanna say he needed more than data. Right now, his uh, uh, an alum friend from Fisk University comes, Thomas Calloway, and says, look, we have monies to create this American Negro um, exhibit at the Paris Exposition. So they set off. In the middle, you see uh, a sampling of the data portraits that I want to mark. Du Bois and his students created these. Um, they are hand drawn and hand colored in. And my co-editor Britt and I, until we find out otherwise, we are seriously, seriously of the opinion that Du Bois did not color these in. These were his students, men and women at Atlanta University. He had an Atlanta school of sociology and what this exhibit does is it shows you through, through my opinion, the transformation of between the Philadelphia Negro and the 1900 exposition, which then in many ways leads into this major book he writes in 1903 called The Souls of Black Folk. You are beginning to see how his approach to race is changing. On the left, where you see the actual American Negro exhibit as it was in the, 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 the hall it was held in, everything in at that exhibit was written by, made by, or pictures of black people in the United States. And for him, these, this, these data portraits are works of art. They're colorful. They are in French and English, but it's also um, the first time that he uses the term or the, 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 the saying, the problem with the 20th century is the problem of the color line was at the 1900 exposition in Paris. Um, I just, it, it, it always, um, fills me up and I, and I would love to keep going talking and talking about this Paris exposition, 
But for me, it is a marker of kind of the transformation that then leads to the souls of Black folk and other things by Du Bois. So Du Bois is always known as a scholar, a writer, an editor of the Crisis Magazine, where here you have the offices of the Crisis Magazine. Um, he's also co-founder of the Niagara Movement, which becomes the NAACP. He was one of the founders of the Pan-African Congress. But for me, one of the most important aspects of Du Bois's genealogy is intellectual genealogy, is him being a champion, an international champion for peace. And that will later come to um, help him make the decision to leave the United States and not come back. So here he is in the crisis. And I, and I like to show this because Du Bois in the Paris Exposition exhibit used all kinds of photographs from Hampton, in Hampton University, Howard University, um, Wilberforce, um, Atlanta University, Spelman, Morehouse. What he's doing is that he is using photographs and those exhibit that exhibit that you saw, he wanted to show the world that the American Negro, even though slavery had ended in 1865, here it is 1900. And even in the South, we are educators, we are learning skills, we are property owners, we are entrepreneurs, and we are amazing. This is not an image that you had because at the same Paris exposition, you have exhibits of quote unquote Africans in their natural habitat, right? You have, you have exhibits of people and looking at them in ways that, that, that are, is subhuman to be honest. Du Bois was showing something that was real and very different but was provable and based for him on data. So I do want to bring up the fact that Du Bois found lots of ways to interact with, um, lots of ways to interact at multiple levels with the black community, right? So here he is at Howard University. I skipped way far ahead, 1932, but I love this picture, especially because there's some brothers all the way in the back that are actually holding up the sign for the picture that I wouldn't want that job. But here Du Bois is in the center right here. And he was an honorary member of Alpha Phi Alpha, which is the first, um, uh, Black Greek lettered organization in the US founded at Cornell. Um, so I use this quote because I really like it and people often misquote it. So I always like to kind of have it for real so that we can learn from it. Thus all art is propaganda and ever must be despite the wailing of the pursuits Oh, I'm sorry, the wailing of the purists, I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art I have for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the right of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda but I do care when propaganda is confined to one side while the other is stripped and silent. I bring this up because as I said, data is not the only way in which Du Bois reaches out to the black community. He creates this uh, pageant, sorry, I forgot the word, called the Star of Ethiopia. 
And I want to say it was about five hours um, with over 700 cast members. Because what was it about? It was about the contributions of Black people throughout time. I mean, throughout all time, which means that he, the costumes, the um, musical numbers, this was something, and I completely forgot to, to remember what, the price of the ticket was extremely low. He wanted everyone to come out and see how amazing Black folks are. But this idea that Black folks should know for themselves how to enjoy and love is something that you often don't hear when it comes to scholarship or scholars talking about Du Bois. But for me, the star of Ethiopia is one of those examples of Du Bois's use of what he calls propaganda through art. But it is just like those very beautiful colored data portraits. It is to draw you in, to learn more of the details of everyday life from this grand scheme of the star of Ethiopia as a black person living in New York, which is one of the places it, it debuted, uh, where it was shown that you could see yourself in that story of greatness. So I'm going to jump ahead, but still kind of be in the back and forth conversation with Du Bois as I come to a sort of conclusion. I'm looking at my time. Um, this is, was on the campus of, of um, UMass Amherst. I, I want to say it's 2018. Um, 2020 has thrown my years off, so my apologies. Um, but this was in a response to, this is an area that once a month it is painted and it becomes kind of the vocal space for students. Um, and this is what there was, this is what students on campus decided. This is actually the second iteration of it um, because there was a lot of um, graffiti about all lives matter drawn over it and the students came back and did a lot more. And this was the result. Um, but I, I go there because I wanna talk about learning and teaching about Du Bois in our current moment. Um, having seminars and um, fellows, uh, postdocs from all over the country come and talk about their research on Du Bois has been eye-opening and has contributed to many of the curriculums of former students that went through UMass, but it's also professors and, and faculty and staff that come and actually engage and realize that they can learn so much about Du Bois. And here is this man from Massachusetts, just like us. I'm not from Massachusetts, sorry. Um, but that um, kind of helped to shape how people are beginning to see Du Bois in the 21st century. One of the things that we really spend a lot of time and we've got donors that, that help us with this is that we've given away hundreds of, bo of, of books, the souls of black folk to our students and staff and faculty, whoever want them. And it's interesting because we've done this over consecutive years and a couple of students have said, well, I, I got one last year and we say, well, you can take another one, it's fine. And they wanna share it with someone or they took theirs home and gave it to their brother and they need a new one. And it's these kind of exchanges that really remind us of the community effort in the everyday lives of people and how Du Bois still factors in that picture, in that scenario. Um, so the archives, I'm back to the archives because we have 
these, this picture right here are three of our postdocs. And when the postdocs come, they come in the summer and they spend five days a week in those archives, combing, taking notes, taking pictures, doing the thing. Yes, the collection is digitized, but at UMass, we not only have W.E.B. Du Bois's papers, but we have um, um, David, Lever, Dev, David Levering Lewis's paper and uh, papers, and he's the one Pulitzer, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author, the biography of Du Bois volumes one and two, all of the notes, all of the interviews, everything that didn't go into the book is at the archive. Horace Mann Bond papers are there. Um, we are starting to get papers because Du Bois attracts people to want those archives to be there with Du Bois. But what that has also done is it has created for what I consider a radical activist archival home for many papers and many people that don't necessarily see their work as important, but it really is. Um, and again, I said that I, I just had to throw this photo in because we always have members of Alpha Phi Alpha. Remember Du Bois was an honorary member, Alpha Phi Alpha brothers giving out books with us at the Du Bois Center. And I just happened to be in the sister organization. So that's why we take silly pictures with our hands up. Um, but also the students, the students that we bring in, whether they're high school level, college level, um, they are amazed by the ability, of course, there's some protective things over the papers, but they are amazed at how easy it is for them to touch history, to really touch something that has to do with this great figure, Du Bois, who we hear about. We have a lot of fun with students. And I know that um, recently, and this was in 2018, um, the um, Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus acknowledged um, Du Bois's birthday or his, his birth, um, you know, at, um, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's those moments that remind me that 10 years ago or even five years ago to that extreme, everybody wasn't so happy around Du Bois. Um, these are um, postdoctoral fellows as well as graduate students and two of my three children um, in this photo um, at the birth site of Du Bois, which is now technically a parking lot, but we do have a, um, a plaque. And I put this in because I want to tell you that working in Great Barrington has not always been easy. The um, UMass are the stewards. We technically own the, the Du Bois home site. So it's a kind of a satellite property of UMass. But what we, what we have done is try to create an environment where you can go onto the property um, and read and learn with signs similar to this middle one here about the life of Du Bois, like the intricacies of who he was, why was Great Barrington so important to him and things like that. And it is a place that has developed a taste for Du Bois that I never thought I would see when I first started working on this. Um, there are now three murals um, dedicated to Du Bois that were created by what's here, RSYP, which is the Railroad Street Youth Project. And these are incredible young activists from Great Barrington who are very much a part of the rebirth of Du Bois in Great Barrington. And I would say in many ways in Massachusetts. Um, because for me, this is back to the archives. 
for me, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways in which that moment that was really the focus of my talk, that moment that changed Du Bois from thinking that data would prove truth, would prove progress. There were other ways to do this. And it is through his plays, his literature, his poetry, not the best poetry, but it's okay. Um, his scholarship, you can find a quote from Du Bois to talk about any situation that we have faced or are in the process of facing. Du Bois is extremely relevant at today as he was when he lived. And I like this picture of Du Bois because he's in his office, he's comfortable. But for him, I think the satisfaction is that his legacy, because in his final letter that he wrote um, that was to be opened after his death, he wrote that whatever I have not finished, I leave for a new generation to pick up and continue. Du Bois knew that his time on this earth, although it was 95 years, right, was lengthy and he did a lot, but he understood that he was one individual mentoring all kinds of other folks. Yet it was that kind of connection, that kind of mentorship, that kind of communication that allows for his work to be relevant and for all these other kinds of ways in which Du Bois expressed himself to be taken up and to be further um, taken to new heights in the 21st century. Um, I like to show this picture. This is a, a kind of a dated picture, but this is the um, Society for Black Archaeologists. When I first started in this archaeology game, there was like five of us in the country. We have generations of folks. The folks in this picture are working in the Virgin Islands. My sister Alicia in this picture is from Tulsa and she's a part of those excavations that are trying to understand what happened during the Tulsa massacre. Um, you've got folks in here working in the Caribbean, working all over the African continent in the Caribbean. And this to me is another example, a direct example that I have of, of, of the ways in which Du Bois has influenced archeologists. Um, oh, and there was my last one. And I wanna say thank you. I know apparently this is Maine and you all might recognize this place, um, but I had to take a picture because apparently this is a tradition when you go to Maine, you have to sit on this boot. So I did that and I think I can, I think I wanna stop and I'm sorry if I went way over my time. Not at all, Whitney, you're perfectly right on time. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We learned uh, quite a bit about Du Bois. And I want to invite folks in the audience, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. We'd love for you to start typing any questions that you have for Dr. Battle Baptiste in the chat. I'm going to also invite uh, Leroy and Lance, my colleagues, to unmute their screens um, and unmute their, their audio. And while we wait for the questions to come into the Q and A, um, I would love to kick it off with one for you. Um, like you, I run a big archive, and I have such profound um, happiness and and sadness when I see all the pictures of students in the archive doing work after a year of COVID-19 when our spaces have been so empty. And I'm wondering how you at the Du Bois Center and certainly with all the classes you work on, a lot of our collections are digitized. So we're doing you know, remote classes and events like this, but how have you kept your own connection to the materiality of what you do in an era where we are just constantly on Zoom? That that's a very good question because I, I, I don't have the answer for that because 
everything I showed you obviously was put, was pre um, COVID-19. And I, um, the digitization aspect of it has been important, but it, it, it doesn't replace the ability to physically touch the material. I don't know how we're going to remedy that. I mean, I know that recently, and this this is this is ironic. We, um, I I don't run the the special collections. That's a whole other person. Um, but I am kind of the outreach arm of the collections. But we just built a seminar room next to kind of the archival room where we can have classrooms, we can have, um, and we have done virtual for my class uh, in the fall, we did a virtual um, archival lesson. So our archivists actually go to that seminar room and they pull specific materials and then they share screen and we actually look at it together and kind of analyze it and talk through kind of the, the major things that, that stand out and um, so that's something that the archivists have pulled together that has been amazing for our students. They have really, you know, those, everyone came to that class and their cameras were mostly on, not all, but um, that was something that I, that they had developed in response to the growing number of classes that are asking to come in and do an archival lesson or two. So that's all I have for that. Yeah, I'm just waiting. I'm really hopeful that next year we can see those spaces, even masked, you know, in in people coming together to learn and, and to do this work. And and I think also very visibly for people to be able to see themselves in the archives. It's just so important for students mm -hmm. of all races, ethnicities, creeds, sexual orientations, religions, to see yourself in your curriculum, to see yourself in the archive. Um, in positive ways. And to that point, there's a question in the chat that I would love to read out loud to you. And Vincent is asking this question. You mentioned that Du Bois has information relevant for nearly any situation. I'm curious if there's writings of Du Bois regarding the LGBTQ plus community, especially considering that in today's society, some of the most marginalized people are black trans women. Wow. Um, yes. And um, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think through that one um, because it brings up for me an aspect of um, kind of the violence against Black people is one thing, but the violence against Black trans women is um, underreported and happens way more than we understand. Um, and I would say in terms of the question, I would actually about Du Bois, he has never, cause that's a good question cause he has never written about LGBTQ issues, concerns. And at the same time, he was, close with members of the black scholarly world as well as the black writing world that were gay and lesbian but not necessarily always out um i believe that for his time he wasn't pretty progressive in that sense and the only why, reason why i would say that is because he was really amazing to the women that he mentored, that he pushed to publishing, that he encouraged to do all kinds of um, amazing things in their own lives. Yet he was extremely uh, hard on his daughter, Yolande Du Bois which I would say that he, you know, pretty much said, you need to marry this, this guy, County Cullen from Harlem. 
everybody in Harlem knew County was gay, but the idea is that it was the, the coupling of Du Bois's daughter and County Cullen. I mean, this was like, you know, a fairy tale um, meeting of, um, dare I say, the Black Illuminati. I don't know um, if that's a word I should use, but it, it, and it wasn't something that I think she was 100% okay with. Um, and it, the marriage didn't, it, it ended quickly. Um, and uh, he never says anything at all. Um, and so that's, that, that's an example that I know of, is that tolerance? I'm not gonna put tolerance on it when I'm not sure if he literally even acknowledged that it existed. <laughs> You know, but so I don't know. I mean, he was extremely close with Lorraine Hansberry and was not judgmental of, you know, who she was, right? But it's it's not to say that I don't, I, I don't, no one's ever asked me that question. Right. Um, when Thank I, you. I, Thank you for that question, for real. Sorry. So we have another question here from Frank. Um, Frank would like to know what kind of advice do you think Du Bois would give the Black Lives Matter movement to advocate uh, or to advance their cause today? Um, I think that for me, <clears throat> the Black Lives Matter movement <clears throat> is one aspect of our struggle, right? Um, I don't think it's the be all and end all, right? So the movement for black lives, say her name, you know, we can go on, um, stop AAPI hate, <clears throat> stop Asian American hate, you know, let's be informed <clears throat> of the murdered and missing indigenous women of our country. Um, I think that <clears throat> solidarity is something that is constantly downplayed in our movements. I think that perhaps advice would be, again, that collective, right? To me, if a Black trans woman is murdered, first of all, and is misnamed, right, is, is, is no one knows her story, right? How is it that, that folks in Black Lives Matter, how is it, even that folks that don't understand what a trans woman might go through, how is it that collectively we can come together and stand in solidarity with Asian Americans, stand in solidarity with, like I said, you know, indigenous women who are murdered every day and no one is investigating these things. So for me, it is about that propaganda, right? That propaganda is really hard to dictate in a world of social media. It's extremely hard to answer a question when Du Bois had the crisis, right? And when they fired him for the, from the crisis because he went too left or wherever, he still had other ways and other means of communicating. And I just think that often there's a, 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 a disconnect, right? So you're either Black Lives Matter or you're Blue Lives Matter. And I don't think that that's a way to solve anything. I think that what we saw in the summer of 2020 was for the first time people, all people, becoming so enraged, right? That it wasn't about who they were, what their gender was, what their class was, what color they were. I think those are the kinds of moments that seem more true to what Du Bois's advice would be. Understand that Du Bois came under scrutiny because of his relationship with China, because of his relationship with Russia, because of his invitation by Nkrumah and him going over to this independent nation. Like the idea that Du Bois was about a global movement 
means that the United States is just one aspect. Why are we not up in arms for the constant murder of black men and women in Brazil? Right? Like, why are we not talking about the land grab that's taking land away from black Colombians in Colombia? So like Puerto Rico is in a state of suspension. All of these things are global. And the only thing I can speak to, because I can't say what Du Bois would say, because he probably would give me a bad dream tonight. But the truth is that I see the threads of bringing these movements together because collectively we're the global majority. When are we going to understand that our insistence on keeping separate movements only hurts or only actually only continues this, this thing we call white supremacy? I know I didn't answer it, but. Well, um, there, there seems to be a follow-up question that, that, that um, build on, builds on the, the previous one. And here Amber is asking, knowing how Du Bois advocated so boldly and fiercely in his time, mm -hmm. going off the previous question, what systems do you think Du Bois would want activists and allies to focus on most in this movement? You know, because there, there, there's so much out there um, and there are a whole lot of threads as you pointed out, yeah. that you're advocating a position of bringing these collectives together and speak to the humanity of individuals right. and, and ways in which systems of oppressions could be, we, we could push back against them to affirm the equality of, of our shared humanity, mm -hmm. regardless of our orientation, our race, where we're from, et cetera, that there is a centrality that needs to be recognized and need to be advocated for. Du Bois himself went, through so many different shifts in his lifetimes and political career, um, academic pursuit, um, it would be hard to say what Du Bois would be and say today to these different issues beyond the fact that we need to be firm in our stance about who we are as individuals and what we want and how we want people to recognize us. Now, with that being said, do you see a particular angle today with, in which Du Bois would firmly plant his feet at? at least for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's that's the irony, right? Because Du Bois changed, he said he lived long enough to change his mind several times. And the, what, the first thing that came to my mind as you crafted the question was, it, it was simple in my mind. It was local politics. It was beginning from the local. Now, when I say this, I'm talking about examples like Representative, or she, Senator, no, Representative Cori Bush from Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. You are talking about a space and, and it was the incident that led to the death, murder of Michael Brown that took Black Lives Matter as a movement Black Lives Matter as a social media movement to Black Lives Matter as a physical presence, right? Because you have Black Lives Matter is about local chapters. It's about understanding the local needs of each chapter, not Black Lives Matter coming in to swoop down and tell you how to be free, supposedly. But locally, how do you create a space where you can be there. I'm, we're in Massachusetts, well, I'm in Massachusetts. So it's like town meeting, select board, school committee, um, state representative, senator. I understand that the presidency is extremely important, but think about if the power of democracy is with the people, then the people should say to the police, you're not going to be a police officer if you don't pass your test every year. And let's check your record because we are policing in a community way that benefits us. 
if you are here to serve and protect, then you need to have a conversation with the people you are protecting and serving, right? So how do you do that? How, and I'm not, and maybe that's a roundabout way to say defund the police. I'm not saying that. I'm saying rethink, recalibrate how we view policing. The ways, part one of the ways to get there is understanding that as the people, we can harness the power of local because for Du Bois, it's the grassroots that from which grows into something that could potentially change the nation. We didn't take that opportunity up during the reconstruction era, right? And on January 6th, when, um, uh, I, was, I couldn't think of the word, uh, the insurrectionists, right? When they <laughs> stormed the Capitol, the idea, right, of, of, of citizens taking the cap, it just, it, it blows my mind to think about how we're viewed so differently, right? And, and, and the fact that the, in, like invoking 1876, as if that was a good year, right? For, for black people, guess what? That's the beginning of Jim Crow. That's not a positive moment. So the fact that so many of us in this country actually don't grasp the significance of 1876 and what it meant is an example of how do we take back our democracy? We take it from the local and move it beyond. I mean, those are, that's something that Du Bois wrote about. I mean, he ran for Senator of New York. Yeah, State Senate. Thank you. And uh, we've got one last question that is actually quite local to, to wrap it up as we, as we close this evening. And Christy's wondering your opinion of the controversy of Great Barrington refusing in the 1960s to preserve or honor Du Bois's homestead um, because the community sort of outwardly criticized his communist views to justify it. Is there scholarship now or, or movements afoot or where you are in the archives that shows that that maybe wasn't communism, but more racism. Is there mm -hmm. a shift in that? Okay. Um, <laughs> Great Barrington would never admit that. Um, I got to UMass in 2007. When I got here, I know I look good for my age. I have a lot of gray hair, but it's okay. Um, the idea to say Du Bois's name was controversial in its own way. The idea was that Du Bois gave up his US citizenship, became a communist, did not like, did not like America anymore, and all the and and of that generation of World War II veterans were pretty much at the forefront of kind of the communism, the call that communism was the reason. But it's really interesting when I would engage in conversations because I, I would talk to anybody, especially if they tell me they don't like Du Bois. I'm like, oh, well, we need to talk. And what I learned from that is when I talked about the Burkhardt family, faces changed. Attitudes changed. The Burkharts were a respected family. The Burke, they owned that property for over 150 years. It was, you know, so I'm like, what's the problem? Oh, the problem is the focus on W.E.B. Du Bois. He left here, he never came back. And I'm like, what? His entire family is buried in Great Barrington. His wife, his son, his daughter, you know, and, and it's like he made sure all of his family was near the Burkhards. Like for him, that was bringing them home. The, the movement has changed because of the generational shift. Now the middle school will be named the W.E.B. Du Bois Middle School. That passed, that went forward. The legislators, the um, select people, there is, the month of February, the entire downtown has signs that all read Du Bois. 
like quotes from him along the lampposts. Like I see so much Du Bois and Great Barrington, it makes my head spin to think about that 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 fight, right? Like, wait, wait, where are the people I was fighting? And why are they not talking to me anymore? They're, I don't know where they are. But um, the point being that to, to be able to see that shift change and those three murals I showed you are the youth, right? The youth that when they first learn about, when they first learn about how much they don't know about Du Bois, they get very upset very upset. And what they do is they took it into their own hands and they created what they wanted. And they wanted to show him in Ghana. They wanted to show like, and there's a sign where someone has a sign up on the mural that says Black Lives Matter. It's all of those kinds of movements that was because of the generational shift. And now, and I would be more than happy to talk to anyone about communism and being black because it's not just Paul Robeson. It's like, why is it that we don't learn about Claudia Jones? Why is it that we don't know her name? It's not because she was Trinidadian. It was because she was a communist and she believed in her people. Lorraine, Lorraine Hansberry, very left-leaning, but couched as a person who was very bourgeois, right? They do, we just had a movie, The United States versus Billie Holiday. I was so sad about that movie. It was beautiful, Andra Day was amazing, but nobody touched on where that song Strange Fruit came from. Abel Maripol, who adopted the Rosenberg children, the Rosenbergs and the children, and, and from what I understand, this is oral history, so the, the, Mar the Rosenberg children and the Maripoles met at Du Bois's annual Christmas party. We are talking about people who are in each other's spaces all the time collectively. And what are they collectively arguing for and about? For us to take back our country, not to all be communists, but to understand the importance of equality the importance of inclusion. And you're talking about Abel Maripol, a Jewish high school teacher in the Bronx wrote Strange Fruit. Why was he not in that movie? Why was his communist leanings not in that movie? People weren't just chasing Billie Holiday because she sang the song. She sang the song as an act of rebellion. So I just wanna, I just wanna reiterate to me, it this generational shift, hopefully at some point we will understand that we all not, we should all not be afraid of Paul Robeson, right? We should all embrace how those leaders were internationally recognized. Shirley Graham Du Bois, Du Bois's second wife, is buried in China. Du Bois is buried in Accra, Ghana. I feel as if we continue to be narrow and isolated, we are never going to collectively be free. And I mean, not just folks of African descent. For me, that's part of the message that I get from Du Bois. And it's the message that I hope to convey to others as I teach them my version of Du Bois, because I know mine is a little different, but it's also because I'm from the Bronx and I'm a member of the hip hop generation. So that's just how I am. Excellent. Um, there's actually one last question, and if we could just briefly answer it, um, because it's, it's, it's the last one that we didn't get to, to touch on. And here, Elizabeth is asking, I have only recently nailed down how to pronounce Du Bois's last name. <laughs> As a Franco-American from Maine, <laughs> I'd like to know how, how is it that, uh, um, he, he has a French surname, and why is it that we pronounce it in English? Oh, they, oh, wow. Okay, so my second last name is Baptiste, right? So it is Haitian. Du Bois's father was born in Haiti. Mm. His grandfather was born in Long Key in the Bahamas. 
Oh. I'm sorry that I didn't mean to make that noise. Um, I have no idea when and why it is pronounced Du Bois. Speculation has that he often said something around, I am an American, not French, although I am of Huguenot descent, but constantly said his name was pronounced Du Bois. I have no, I have not been able to find evidence of how his father, um, Alfred Du Bois, said his name. I do, however, have some indication that his grandfather, who um, lived out the rest of his life in um, New Bedford, Mass, um, <clears throat> pronounced his name, as far as I know, Du Bois. And he was the one that the Du Bois name came through. I don't, and when they were in the Bahamas, they were French, like their names were Francois and, you know, I don't know when and why Dubois okay. became Du Bois. And it is a question that I wish I knew the answer to. It really, I try to do research and all I find are more Dubois and not any indication of when the name shifted. And I can't help but believe it might have been Dubois, W.E.B. himself. I, I just don't know what, I don't know any Haitians named Du Bois. I, I don't, I don't know all Haitian people, but I'm just saying, yeah. it seems strange. Whitney, thank you so much. Um, you know, in, in the before times, now we're talking to people as they leave the big auditorium and we're going out to dinner in Portland and you're up here walking around on the water in the morning. And we will have those times come back, but we are just so grateful that you spend some time with us this evening and for your openness and your willingness to answer questions and for your beautiful talk. So for that, we thank you. Uh, we thank our wonderful interpreters. I thank my colleagues, Leroy and Lance. And stay tuned folks for the sixth annual Du Bois lecture, which God willing will be in person next year. But Can I really just say thank you, Libby, thank you, Leroy and Lance, but thank you to these amazing sisters, Felicia and April. You have me on my best behavior and I appreciate because I felt what I was saying through your hands. So thank you so, so much. And thank you for Sherry and all the other folks who are doing closed caption. Um, just thank you all. This was a wonderful event. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. We appreciate you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.